And you kind of look around being like, yeah, just, just a little bit of a readjustment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. This one's just for you, gentlemen. And <laughs> apparently, uh, Sheath, who were a previous sponsor, thank you so much, Sheath. Mwah! I think I'm literally kissing my own ass. Um, what? And they said, quote, keep up the epic work, and we might even release a limited line of Sheath with your face on it. <laughs> and I can think of nothing cooler, so please! Purchase some sheaths. I'll tell you more about what it is, why it does, why it is the best underwear you could possibly wear in the near future in this video, in, in, in the mid roll. You know how this works. Welcome to another episode of Business Blaze, history's worst inventions that time forgot. What happens here? Danny shall write me a script, which I have here. They've, they've got super long again. <laughs> I don't know what to say, welcome. Uh, I will add my own flavor of bullshit and Sam will sprinkle in some fine vintage memes. It was literally only a few weeks ago that I found myself holding a hammer in my hands with reckless intent and screaming at the sky that I'd discovered the worst invention in the entire universe. Okay. It wasn't the hammer. It was a carbon monoxide detector and it had driven me to the brink of insanity and also saved you and your family's lives, Danny. <laughs> Carbon monoxide detectors are amazing, because carbon monoxide, it just comes and it silently kills you. But let's see why Daddy doesn't like this life-saving invention like a dick. I've always had a bit of a problem with smoke alarms and car alarms and house alarms. Danny, please don't turn out to be a criminal. And I realize I'm on dodgy grounds having a go at something like the smoke alarm, which I know should be installed in every home and which I'm sure has saved many lives over the years. Oh my god, I have to do it again. I have to do it again. Maybe someone will finally be in, in this wide audience. It must have been in the 1990s. There was a commercial for just, I think it was by the government, just for installing smoke alarms. And it is the most chilling advert that I've seen in my life. And it, tell me British people, does anyone else remember this? No. It's like, a, it's the, the advert starts and it's like ba 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 da ba ba da Do you forget the little things in life? Ba 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 Forget to take out the trash and there's like a dude and he's like ah, Like forget your car keys and he's like ah, oh, I forgot my car keys Forget to change the batteries in your smoke alarm And then the music just ends and it's this dude sitting in front of his burned out house crying because his family are dead And it's like holy sh** <laughs> And from that point on, it gives me the chills thinking about it. And from that point on, I always have a f***ing smoke alarm. Well done, government. You got me good. You f***ing assholes. Um, I would... Uh, maybe it's not as dramatic as I remember, because I've thought about it so many times, but holy shit. And also, for some reason, the guy in my mind doing the advert is Gary Lineker. I'm almost certain it wasn't him, but for some reason, he's the face I see. Him, you know, doing smoke alarms and Walker's crisps. <laughs> oh, Gary. Which I know should be installed in every home, which I'm sure has saved many lives over the years. Many, many lives. I just wish that mine wouldn't go off every time I fire a bit of bacon or put the kettle on or breathe slightly heavily. Car and heart house alarms were always largely pointless in my old neighbourhoods. You generally hear some kind of alarm letting off an ear piercing and long winded screech at least once a day. And quite often in the middle of the night. It's true, it's true. When was the last time you had a car alarm go off? I mean, I live in a city. So it's like, I have, the, although, I know, do cars still have alarms? I mean, aren't they just, don't they just have immobilizers? So it's like, it's basically impossible to steal unless you're an expert thief and then you're gonna be stealing super high-end cars. So I don't think cars get stolen that often anymore, like they did back in the day. But still, if there's a car alarm going off, I'm just, it's like, okay, <laughs> definitely not getting out of bed. <laughs> And it's not like anyone was going to spring into action to save the day. We all just assumed that some antisocial dickhead got a dodgy alarm, which had accidentally activated again, because that was nearly always the case. Yeah, there's a computer store or like computer repair shop opposite my house, opposite my apartment, and they had some dodgy alarm and it used to just go off all the time. Like every few weeks it would just go off for hours. And be like, please, just please fix it. Why? Please no! 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 Because that was nearly always the case. A massive gang of criminals could have been stealing every car and burgling every house on the street, letting off a cacophony of alarms in the process, and nobody would have batted an eyelid. We might have just turned the TV volume up a bit. This particular carbon monoxide detector had been quietly lurking on my ceiling for years, and I'm almost sure it had been doing a sterling job in sniffing out any potentially toxic fumes. But then one day, it suddenly started emitting three loud beeps about 
every 10 minutes. I had a quick look through the online manual and discovered this meant that the device had reached the end of its life. At first, I assumed that I could maybe just replace the lithium battery. But no, the manual advised me that the battery was not replaceable in this model and that I needed to buy a whole new unit. I had a go at getting this inside this device anyway, and this set off a deafening 10-second squeal, which I later learned was an anti-tampering feature. <laughs> it's your own f***ing smoke uh, carbon monoxide alarm. Although I do feel I wouldn't open them up, because I believe smoke detectors are radioactive. So I'd be like, let's just not f*** around with them. Ah! They didn't really want you playing around with this thing, and that's fine, but nothing in the manual explained how it was meant to stop the beeping or dispose of the detect uh, detector. <laughs> dictator. That's rude. Dispose of the detector or depose the dictator. I tried tossing it in the but a bum bum I tried tossing it in the dustbin, but the constant noise would have annoyed everyone else on the street. I briefly considered just smashing the whole thing to bits with a hammer, but then had a last second change of heart when I became concerned that smashing the lithium battery might be dangerous. I felt as if the only option left on the table was to lob it into the raging fires of Mount Doom in Mordor. I probably shouldn't reveal how I eventually disposed of this carbon monoxide detector. Alright then, keep your secrets. But I would be amazed if I could find a single product in history that is more annoying and more badly designed and more ill-conceived than that small wailing white box of bollocks i just i guess if this was me i don't know if this is the right solution but i'll just go take it and you know like there's bins on the street i'll just go around an area where no one lives like maybe a shopping street and just just put it in the bin <laughs> just <laughs> just walk by hello beep beep sh and then sneakily walk off. Now I really want to know how Danny got rid of his, smoke, his carbon monoxide alarm and I'll probably follow up with him by email. Still, I'm happy to give it a go anyway by traveling back in time to take a look at some of the most truly terrible failed inventions which should have never left the drawing board. Baby cages. Oh, I don't know about that. Having a baby cage. Well, I have a baby or like a toddler now. And they made they make this ring fence thing, which is brilliant. And you put the baby, the toddler, in the ring fence thing and it can't climb out. And it's got its toys in there and shit. And I'm like, this is amazing. So you can like go to the other room, like preparing some dinner or whatever, and just ignoring your child. I'm like, perfect. No, but seriously, it is very useful. And my wife was like, no, I don't want to use that anymore. I'm like, why not? And she's like, I, I feel like she's too restricted in it. And I'm like, but it's so useful. And uh, we don't use it anymore. <laughs> The year is 1931 and the little baby Gerald is taking in the view of the bustling streets of London. Mr. Wimble is clearly late for work again as he races down the cobblestones clutching his briefcase. The little pickpocket Jimmy Strawtooth is up to his usual tricks as he tries to pinch enough coins to buy a loaf of bread. And Mrs. Bumpkin is hanging out her washing on the line and running across the street even though the weather forecast on the wireless mentioned heavy rain this morning. Danny, we've slipped into fiction and I love it. But baby Gerald is largely oblivious to of this he's just playing with his rattle i'm wondering why exactly he's been put in a metal cage which is precariously suspended from the outside of a top story window of an 80 foot high apartment block in 1931 what is going on and what why would he be outside Tuberculosis was on the rise at the beginning of the 20th century and it was felt that open air and good ventilation were crucial steps in fighting the disease ah if only they'd known about antibiotics the American pediatrician Luther Emmett Holt had already published a best-selling guidebook aimed at new parents and nurses and explained how young babies should be regularly exposed to good old-fashioned fresh air and cool temperatures. Man, guidebooks in the past were lame. It's like how to avoid tuberculosis, whereas the future it's like your guide to the Louvre. He reckoned this helps renew and purify the blood, keeping the bouncing baby in healthy shape and all primed for the day as they grow up and go and get shot in the war. <laughs> oh, so depressing. The past was the worst. If you'd like to buy a t-shirt that says the past in the worst, perch the merch go. It's like, well, it's one of my favorite catchphrases on this channel because, you know, everyone's like, oh, the present sucks, it's COVID. And, like, everyone's, like, really bad. And, I, I don't know, there's lots of, uh, there's still definitely tons of wrong with the world but in the past there was a lot more like tuberculosis was worse than covid <laughs> and someone's like which one do you rather have tuberculosis or covid i'll be like mm, let me think <laughs> neither would be the number one option <laughs> Luther recommended that you should consider placing your baby basket next to an open window at regular intervals throughout a breezy day. But that would probably be a tad dangerous if you lived at the top of a tall apartment block. So, in 1906, a young mother in New York by the name of Eleanor Roosevelt. That's Eleanor Roosevelt? Took Luther's advice one step further. The 21-year-old openly admitted that she knew absolutely nothing 
about handling or feeding her baby Anna. But she thought she was onto a good idea when she hung a chicken wire cage out the window of the top level apartment and lobbed her baby in there for a few times a day to catch a few winks in the New York air. This doesn't sound like the worst idea in the world. Like when I was, when our, when our baby was very young, uh, and it was, you know, summer, nice day, we'd put the little crib thing out on the balcony and they'd sleep gloriously in the shade and this little crib thing. It was really nice. I mean, the balcony's got big, like, walls, so she's not gonna go anywhere. Also, she couldn't even get out the crib because she's a baby. Nobody else agreed that this was a good idea and Eleanor eventually took it to, took it down and forgot the whole silly thing after several neighbors threatened to report it to the authorities. Incidentally, Eleanor's husband was a guy called Franklin D. Roosevelt, is her? And Eleanor would later go on to become the longest serving first lady in US history. She showed them. The idea didn't stay buried for long though. In 1922, Emma Reed from Spokane, Washington was granted a patent for a very similar invention. Emma's baby cage looked like a chicken coop or a modern air conditioner guard. The big mesh cage was fast onto your window frame and was lined with soft fabric so that the baby would at least be comfortable while dangling 10 stories high. Some later deluxe models also came with a weatherproof roof shield, but it was quite expensive so most babies were at risk of getting rained on, shat on by pigeons, or hit by a falling roof tile. They do have a cage on the top. Like, I'd want the top bit caged as well. You know, like a normal cage. Emma's patented version also featured a collapsible design for portability so you could take it on your travels and hang your baby out of any window in any location with no hassle. If I was running, I'd be like, don't, no, none of those baby cages. No, not after the last time. That, that was very expensive legal action. It took a while for the baby cage to take off with parents, and curiously, it was the Londoners of the 1930s who were generally more attracted to the idea of putting their baby inside an outdoor metal prison, even if this meant that the baby would largely just be choking on the thick London smog. Ah, yes. I mean, London's pretty smoggy and today, and 100 years ago, it was like, it. you're gonna get, like, lung diseases, all of them. You've probably got COVID. It's perhaps not impossible to understand why apartment dwellers without access to a back garden may have been drawn towards this VIP penthouse suite for babies, although I'm pretty sure there must have been at least a few health and safety concerns over the concept of shoving kids inside a cage suspended 80 feet in the air. Also, they're gonna get all of the diseases. Also, I'm sure like pigeon No one's been like, that's okay. It's okay if you like, if I'm in the pot, there's a I'm like, keep my baby away from that. Number one priority. That dodgy looking man with the weird glasses who's gonna probably kidnap shot. He's the set. Don't touch that shit. And stay away from the weird man. I'm the cool dad. That's that's my thing. Or maybe London parents just didn't love their kids as much as New York parents. You're probably true. The baby cage had largely disappeared from London by the 1940s, but this had nothing to do with a sudden realization that it might be a dreadful invention. It's just that Luftwaffe had started bombing Britain, and even London parents felt that leaving their babies outside alone during the Blitz might not be the best idea. Ah! Oh my God! Was that yeah? Yeah, you don't. You don't want to do that. Spaghetti aid. Oh God! Like a drink from spaghetti that is rough. This is something that I might have been tempted to buy myself if it didn't look quite so ridiculous. As much as I enjoy a well-prepared spaghetti bolognese, it's probably not a meal that I would choose to eat in public in front of someone I was trying to impress because I just know that things are gonna get messy. Yeah, I don't eat tagliatelle or spaghetti in restaurants. I just don't order it because I don't know how to eat it. I mean, of course I do, but it's like, I'm getting messy and it's not okay to put a napkin in your shirt because we're not at a barbecue restaurant. It's usually an Italian place. I, I just, just stay away from it. Also pasta, I feel is like the worst calories. If someone was like, you know, how do you want to get calories in their most tasteless form inside your body? The answer would be pasta. Like bread is like, I know people love pasta and all that shit. Bread, oh my God, it's so much like, ah, oh, bread, pasta, mm, it's okay, it can be good, but bread, oh. Daddy, chill. I love bread. <laughs> I realize that most people have probably mastered the art of eating long strings of pasta without getting sauce all over their chin or resorting to just sucking the spaghetti directly from the plate. But I've never really managed it. Me neither, Danny. <laughs> you know what I did manage, Danny? Learning to drive! <laughs> I don't know why I'm just dishing out an unnecessary burn on Danny. I'm sorry. Please don't leave. I usually just cut it all into tiny pieces before attempting to eat it, but this just makes me think I might as well not have chosen spaghetti bolognese in the first place. Fortunately, help was at hand in 1955 for fellow spaghetti strugglers. The Wisconsin inventor, Russell E. Oaks, came up with Spaghetti Aid, a fabulous contraption aimed to deter turn demolishing a plate of spaghetti into a piece of toast. Oh, okay, so it's not, I was thinking like Gatorade, like someone's made an aid out of spaghetti, and no, I'm not gonna make it. 
rotting turtle as a perfume was far enough we're not making spaghetti aid. <laughs> I do absolutely love that I'm in a position in like my career, <laughs> career, where it's like I can come up with some, we could probably make that, like I could probably find someone to make that and sell it. <laughs> it's absolutely wild and I love it. It was cumbersome beast though. The long fork was attached to a big lever and after you'd dunked the fork into your pasta you wind the lever so that the spaghetti dwells smoothly around your utensil before committing to putting it in your mouth. The problem is that it looks like you brought a massive fishing rod to the dining table and if one of the main points of using spaghetti aid is to try and avoid looking like a tit then it would be considered a bit of a failure in that regard. Yeah I mean no one's finding it acceptable if you roll up to like a nice Italian restaurant and it's like what have you got? I brought my own spaghetti eating devices like why are you six like come on stop it and take that napkin D it's, don't tuck that in your neck but maybe russell was onto something here decades later other people took the basic idea and produced a more compact and portable motorized spaghetti twirler which looked a bit more like a normal utensil and may not raise too many eyebrows at the junction 27 restaurant what is the junction 27 rest is that some joke i'm missing am i missing a joke I'm absolutely missing a joke because Danny put it in bold and italics. Like, ah ha ha! Junction 27! I'm so dumb. Some of Russell's other ideas never really caught on, though, during his glorious non career. He also came up with a mechanical donut dunker, a horizontal toaster which spat hot toast in your face, and a weird soup spoon which discreetly drained bad soup through a hidden tube and into a bottle strapped to your leg so that you could pretend to be enjoying the soup without offending your host. <laughs> You're just sitting there like, like, you know, suction. Oh, shit, birds! Be awkward. How innovative! I like it! The guy clearly had even bigger dining issues than me. You know what you won't have any issues with? That's right, your dick and balls if you switch to sheath underwear. Yes! Mwah! They said I could do anything I want with a reed, so we're talking about dick and balls! What? Please actually show the sheath underwear on screen at the beginning of the integration. You're welcome! You're fired! You copy that? You're fired! No, seriously, let me tell you a little bit about Sheath. So that the dudes over at Sheath were like, mm. Regular underwear? It's not very good, is it? What's the problem with it? Well, I don't know, but there's nothing worse. I, I swear, like, do you ever feel like you're the one who does it more than everyone else? When you're just like, just readjusting yourself? And I know it's probably because I'm consciously aware of it and you kind of look around being like, Yeah, just, just a little bit of a readjustment. <laughs> no big deal, no big deal. But it's not a good look, gentlemen. Um, so what you need to do is you need to switch to sheath, for reasons that I will explain. On the front here, there is a pouch. You might have seen pouches before. I mean, I'm not a big box of briefs man. I'm generally a box of short man, until I've discovered these. Because, like, I don't like everything, like, shoved into the weird pouch at the front that you get on box of briefs. Because I'm like, oh, it's all just rubbing together. It's not very pleasant, is it? And I don't know, it just gets all wedgy-ish and you're like, mm -hmm. What this does is it solves that problem by, and also, but boxes are not the ideal solution because they kind of get all over the place, like I just described. With sheath, you put your dick in here, you put your balls in here, and then you put your legs through the, you know, you're familiar with how they normally work. Um, and it just delivers, it sounds a bit weird, and honestly it is a bit weird, but it does deliver a, uh, what I would describe, maybe they'd even describe it in the copy as a superior underwear experience. Uh, because they separate less smelly too. I mean, that's good, I mean, I shower every day, normally. <laughs> Oh my god, stop fucking lying. So I don't feel like my digger balls get particularly mad, mad sweaty. They were invented by a US Army soldier who came up with the idea for sheath during his second tour in Iraq, where it's hot as hell and his boys needed to breathe. Yeah, look, I don't know. I've never been a soldier in the desert. <laughs> but I still appreciate quite how nice this is. It's not even hot outside. It's still like spring and I'm like, I'm going to enjoy the shit out of this in summer. <laughs> even more than now. Uh, okay, call to action. That's what I have to read so you guys can find out about it. I think the biggest call to action would be like, my legends, what I need is I need... <laughs> I need underwear with my face on it from Sheath. Because that's the sort of legend I want to be. I go to the gym, people will be like, is that your face on your underwear? I'm just joking, I don't go to the gym. Look at me. <laughs> that's not true. I have a little gym in the back of the office where I work out because COVID. Uh, click the link below, use the code BLAZE at checkout, or go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash blaze for 20% off. Mwah! Your dick and balls will thank you. It just says your balls will thank you. Or it says your balls are, you're doing your balls a favor, but there's something to dick and balls that's just like, mm, just rolls off the tongue. Ha! Gay! Uh, again, that's sheathunderwear.com forward slash blaze for 20% off. Or just use the promo code blaze. I really want to, come on guys, get on it. Let's make it happen.
I wish they'd set me a goal, like get sell a thousand or something. That'd be like, <laughs> rally, army of legends. The sound burger. I always preferred the sound and the weight and the feel of the gorgeous packaging of vinyl records over the small crappy cassette tapes that many of my mates used to buy. But those small crappy cassettes did of course have several undisputable advantages over, advantages over vinyl. They were portable. Yes, definitely. <laughs> like, just rocking around. I, I, I feel, I mean, in this world of hipsters, you would, I, I feel like I could definitely see someone like arriving at a cafe, coffee shop, They'd open a briefcase, they'd set it up on the table, there would be a, a, a record player inside, they'd plug it in, they'd get those big unnecessarily large headphones, they'd put them on, and they'd just listen to a vinyl record because this is the world we live in. <laughs> Fucking hipsters. And I wanna be like, Simon, you're such a hipster. Just because I have a beard doesn't mean I'm a hipster. If you've seen me without a beard, it's obviously a good look for me. Well, a, a better look. Most of the comments for a long time were like, Simon, never shave the beard. No one wants to look at your baby face. That's rude. It's like, all right. <laughs> Made me feel bad for the first 27 years of my life. <laughs> they were portable, so my mates could bring over a big pocket full of tapes and play them at home without getting weighed down or worrying about damage. And my mates could also play their music on the move. They could brighten up a dreary paper rounds by blasting out a bit of mega death from their Walkmans while delivering the wrong newspapers to the wrong house and getting knocked down by milk floats that they couldn't hear coming because they're electric. Oh, I would obviously never have been able to do that with my big clunky records, or could I? Well, no, I couldn't. But stick with me for a second on the Wait, has someone actually invented a portable record? <laughs> This has got to make a comeback. Hipsters will revive this. What's that? Sorry, I was taking a selfie while shooting a Snapchat, while periscoping that Snapchat, while Instagramming latte art, while shazamming the weekend, while streaming Master of None, while retweeting George Takei, while saying, this wins the internet, while still being hashtag so bored. In 1983, Audio Technia launched one of perhaps the oddest music devices in history, a portable record player they christened the Sound Burger. It kind of looks like a little yellow stapler. Uh, I've got an image. Sam, do the honors. You opened up the stapler, pull, pulled out the retractable stylus, and clamped the device around your record to enjoy the full glory of Megadeth on vinyl without being confined to your home stereo setup. And now I'm gonna sound like a massive hipster, but I'm like, this isn't a bad idea, and I'll explain myself. No. Nowadays, it's like, well, yeah, I'll just listen to 320 kilobits per second MP3s on Spotify because that's perfectly high quality enough for me. If you're a real music snob and you want to like have flack or lossless, then just get a Tidal or one of those services where you can listen to flack music. But back in the day, they had like tapes or vinyl. Tapes sound like it. vinyl sounds good. This seems quite reasonable. Now, a lot of people have taken the piss out of such a novelty piece of kit, and some of the criticism is not always justified. It's obvious that you're not going to be taking the silly thing out with you while you're delivering papers or mooching down into town. The record would jump and skip all over the place with every step that you took. Early CD players, portable CD players, had that same problem. And I remember Sony invented something called, or maybe they didn't invent it, but they called it jog proof. And then it was like, oh my god. It just never skips. How? What is this witchcraft? <laughs> I remember my dad's car had like an early CD player in it. And while the car, it, on like a cold day, it would skip, the music would just be like skipping until the car got warm and then it would be okay. It was like it was weird. Oh my God, it's so good to live in the future. <laughs> it's like you get in your car and it just starts like playing the music from Spotify and you're like, Beautiful, thank you. And while some critics suggest that this long-awaited vinyl equivalent of the Sony Walkman was a design failure, it was never intended to be that in the first place. The instruction manual clearly stated that the Sound Burger, is also a terrible name, uh, needed to be used on a completely flat and steady surface. Uh, bearing that in mind, it's hard to see who exactly would want a Sound Burger and why. I suppose you could take it around your mate's house, but then they've probably got their own proper record player that doesn't run out of battery power halfway through that Wurzel's record. Well, if you're an absolute music snob, and you're going on holiday or whatever, and you want to listen to some good music while you're away. Am I a maximum level hipster or Because I'm like, this doesn't sound bad. I mean, I'd never buy it, and I'll just listen to tapes because it's so much easier. But I understand why it exists, because I wouldn't call them hipsters. There are some people who are just music snobs. But they've probably got their own record player that doesn't run out of battery power halfway through that Wurzel's record. Maybe you could use it to play records on holiday without having to pack your entire stereo, but you're still going to need to haul around all those records with you, so you'd need a pretty big suitcase. It seems to me that vinyl was just never meant to be particularly a particularly portable format. The size of the records kind of gives that away. Another issue is that the Soundburger wouldn't be an ideal format for anyone 
anyone who likes to take care of their precious record collection. The completely unprotected turntable left your records fully exposed while they were playing, and the fact that the device only supports the record from the middle means that both the record and the stylus will gradually bend over time. It wasn't a total disaster. Apparently, the quality of the sound coming through the little fluffy headphones was surprisingly good for such a tiny record player, and collectors are happy to splash out a small fortune on picking up rare burgers today, even though most of them are broken, as they weren't built to stand the test of time. People buying this now is like, yeah, I bought a broken piece of obsolete technology, you hipster. In many ways, it was a bit like Burger King's plant-based Whopper. It was. <laughs> it was an interesting idea that was quite well done, but it's just that nobody ever really fancied one. <laughs> True. I left my meat at home. Sorry, I, I sort of forgot it. Get that out of my face! The anti-bandit briefcase. Oh, is that, like, bandits people who take them. Is this like the handcuffs that goes around the briefcase? Because I'm like, look, whatever's in that briefcase is gonna, and like, these are in movies all the time. In a sense, whatever's in that briefcase is gonna be super valuable. And the person he's gonna be stealing off you is probably not gonna be too bothered about like, what chunk? Either your hands or just like, cut it. It does seem like that insurmountable sort of problem. The year is 1963 and Mr. Wimpy is clearly late for work again as he races down the cobblestones of London clutching his briefcase. Danny? <laughs> Didn't we do this already? No. Uh, even though the weather forecast on the TV mentioned heavy rain this morning, he also spots baby Gerald still crawling around in that silly cage, even though he's pushing 32 now. Meanwhile, that little pickpocket Jimmy Strawtooth has grown up since the 1930s. He's stepped up his game from sneaky pickpocketing to blatant open-air mugging. As Mr. Wimple races down the street, Jimmy Strawtooth steps in front of him and blocks his path with a menacing grin on his face. Mr. Wimple barely has time to catch his breath before Jimmy grabs for his briefcase. But... Mr. Wimple is prepared. This is no ordinary briefcase. This is the Pug Anti-Bandit briefcase. <laughs> Link below. <laughs> Invented in 1963 by John H. D. Rinfett, who is apparently a frequent victim of briefcase burglary, the seemingly ordinary briefcase comes packed with a cunning surprise. A spring-loaded mechanism was attached to the handle, and all Mr. Wimple has to do is cock his thumb very slightly to activate the spring, which opens up the briefcase and rapidly ejects the contents all over the floor. This just sounds annoying. <laughs> Now that'll teach any potential burglar a thing or two, I care to wager. What exactly it'll teach them, I do not know. <laughs> it might teach them that the owner of the Pug Anti-Bandit briefcase is a gullible fool who deserves to be robbed, quite aside from the risk of accidentally ejecting the entire contents of your briefcase during your commute to work every day. I can't really see how just sending everything sprawling onto the floor is a good idea. Yeah, I mean, this is like the worst thing to happen. I remember as a kid we like had briefcases in school. I don't know why. I remember I moved to a new school and suddenly, instead of having backpacks, like normal children, everyone had leather briefcases. Just like these smart leather briefcases. And so I had a backpack because I was the first day of school. <laughs> and everyone was like, ah, a backpack boy. <laughs> ah, why don't you have a leather briefcase? And I was like, I don't know, it's weird. So the next day, of course, I came in with a leather briefcase. One of the things, you know, because you're a kid, you'd absolutely ram it full with all of your books. The worst thing to happen would be then when those little brass things on top would burst open and your briefcase would like, Psh! and all your sh** over and be like, oh, Christ. <laughs> it's not something you purposefully want to do ever. And everyone would be like, ah, briefcase boy, why don't you have a backpack? <laughs> The invention actually feels like a step backward from an earlier version of an anti-bandit briefcase launched in the 1950s. This one was targeted at bank couriers transporting large quantities of cash around the mean streets of London. I know, everything seems rooted in London, but I don't think the rest of the UK was invented until 1968. Honestly, Danny, I'm not even sure that the rest of the UK hasn't been invented. I've never been there. <laughs> This version of the briefcase was based on chemical vapors rather than random ejection. It came with a massive thick cord, and the user attached one end around his wrist before stepping out into the smog. The cord reacted to strain and switched on an electric current, which unleashed a billowing red vapor from the case. Although the vapor was obviously harmless, you clearly don't want to be poisoning a street full of innocent pedestrians. The idea was that it would confuse and engulf Jimmy Strawtooth, while also raising a very visual alarm. The vapor was also dyed red so that it would stain the mugger's clothes as well as any money that he managed to get away with, making it easier in theory to trace both the mugger and his stolen loot. Yeah, I mean, the die packs just are the brilliant, I guess they weren't invented then, but it's like, okay, if someone pulls the briefcase away from the courier, a die pack explodes and ruins all of the money. So even if they take the money, there's nothing they can do with it. And obviously the bank can just take the money and be like, yo, 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 die pack issue. And the Bank of England's the mint? I don't know, who makes all the money? They'll give the bank new money. But if Jimmy Strawtooth goes there and he's like, I've got this ruined money, they'll be like, you're nicked. <laughs> nicked means arrested, American friends. <laughs> Oh. <sighs> 
This is probably a more effective method than the later version, but it's still prone to accidental triggering, and it could end up developing into a very antisocial walk down the high street. Yes, <laughs> I mean, you're not poisoning any bystanders, but they're getting their clothes all stained red. A bigger issue is that the cord was so big it made it blindingly obvious that the user was carrying loads of cash and practically screamed out for an invitation for a well-prepared mugger to come and have a go. I don't think that's true. Look, those security vans are bloody obvious. They're giant and they're filled with money and the glass is like this thick. I think we've all established that, yeah, we know they're full of money. We know it's a terrible idea to try and rob them. Also, I'm, I'm assuming you've seen that video by now of those guys in South Africa where they're getting, uh, it's like, if it's not on your homepage, I don't know how, because it's got like 25 million views in the last two days. And it's of these guys, they're like driving a security house van or whatever, like an armored car, and they're getting shot at and the glass is breaking. And this dude is like doing this insane driving to escape. It is, the guy's a legend. It is an epic video. And they have a massive gun because it's South Africa. <laughs> Gay! Still, all of this would have made an entertaining sight for little baby Gerald as he looks down from his suspended metal cage at the jaw-dropping stupidity of the human race and figures that he's probably off, better off just staying where he is. Yes! This has been an episode of Business but a Business Blaze. Thank you for watching, everybody. Sheath Underwear is where you should go. There is a link below. Also, purchase the merch if you'd like. God, this stuff is so soft. Um, purchase the merch.co. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Sorry, I was taking a selfie while shooting a Snapchat, while periscoping that Snapchat, while Instagramming latte art.